Okay, so um, my EPQ was on the antibiotic resistance crisis. Um, and I, I, I found myself really uh, interested in this because it, it is, we are dealing with an apocalyptic situation. Uh, scientists are very scared about this, and I'm not just exaggerating. Um, it's predicted that by the year 2050, 300 million people will have died, and 100 billion US dollars of money uh, will be spent on the antimicrobial resistance crisis. So it really is a big deal. And that's why I'm asking myself, uh, not so much what science should do about it, we know that science should uh, try to develop uh, medicine against it, but what humanity, what society should do uh, against antibiotic resistance. So before I start to answer this question, uh, let's start by looking at the two uh, fundamentals behind antibiotic resistance, and that's bacteria and antibiotics. So let's start with bacteria. So many of you uh, watching this video may only really know about that much about bacteria, uh, its structure, and also maybe that bacteria causes disease. However, I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail uh, so that we can really have uh, a sufficient understanding uh, to answer uh, my question. Scientists have to classify bacteria um, when, they're, when they take a sample of bacteria, they have to classify it as a certain species so that they know how to treat it. Uh, so the first two ways of classification is by gram reaction and shape, which you can see under the microscope. So gram reaction, you can add something called right stain. If it shows up blue, uh, red under, uh, under right stain, then it is gram positive. If it's blue, it's gram negative. So that just shows you what cell wall the bacteria has got, one form of classification. There's also shape that uh, you can obviously see under a microscope. Uh, so you could have a, uh, a very rod-like shape, that would be bacilli, or a spherical shape, that would be cocci, and then an intermediate shape, uh, which is kind of spherical, uh, or cylindrical in fact, um, would be called coccobacilli. Finally, there's something called spiral bacteria, which has a spiral shape. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, then after you've looked at it under a microscope, you can test its behavior. So you can look at its endospore. Now an endospore is just um, something that the bacteria uses to uh, save it from life-threatening situations. But what's important is its position. So if it's a terminal, subterminal, central, or absent, no endosphere, uh, endospore. So that's another form of classification. Then you can see how it reacts to different um, concentrations of oxygen in the air. Some bacteria are obligate aerobes, they need oxygen in the atmosphere. Some are obligate anaerobes, they need uh, an anaerobic atmosphere. Uh, and some are called facultative anaerobes, which means it doesn't matter. They can live in either environment. And finally, if you still haven't uh, identified which species of bacteria this is from, you can look at where you took the sample of bacteria from. So it might be the cerebrospinal fluid, or the gastrointestinal tract, uh, or from the skin, all these different areas, because certain species of bacteria inhabit certain areas of the body. Uh, so this just helps us to classify bacteria. Now next, what I'm going to do is look at our relationship with bacteria. We may see bacteria as the enemy. That's, that's the uh, temptation, to always see them as the harmful pathogens that cause diseases and cause death. But actually, only a very small minority of bacterial species are pathogens to humans. Uh, many are commensal, so they cause, they're harmless, and many um, actually help us, are mutualistic. So examples of this is where they um, they can access nutrients in our digestive system, uh, this is, which our digestive system can't. Um, and this is especially uh, incredible in our gut, really, because uh, there are millions and millions and millions of, uh, of species of bacteria in our gut. Uh, and just another interesting fact, 
there's a 10 to 1 ratio of bacteria uh, to human cells in the human body. Uh, and we are totally dependent on these bacterial cells. So maybe you could question whether bacteria are us in a way. They're part of us. Uh, other ways that bacteria help us is by fighting pathogens, guiding our immune system and nervous system, uh, and controlling organ growth. So they control and regulate a lot of things in our body, and they break down toxins. So instead of causing disease, a lot of the time they fight disease. However, we must remember that the reason I'm doing this talk today anyway is because they do harm us. Pathogens harm us, and I'm going to show you how. Uh, first of all, they interfere with our necessary metabolism. Uh, and that basically means that they, uh, they inf form an infestation, in, an infection, uh, maybe invade our cells, and just prevent essential biological functions from happening. Um, so the body, being the great uh, defense mechanism that it is, uh, creates an inflammatory response uh, to fight the infection. Uh, unfortunately, though, that is what kills us in the end, because inflammation creates blockages, and blockages prevent uh, essential biological functions from occurring. Uh, so that is how bacteria harm us. So, now that we've looked at bacteria, let's look at the second essential element of, uh, of this talk, and it's antibiotics. Um, in this, in this uh, timeline here, you'll see kind of how it, uh, it develops over time. So it started off uh, in 1000 BC, where ancient peoples were uh, using mold, and they, they didn't realize why, but it was curing infection. Then in 1928, Alexander Fleming discovers penicillin. It gets developed during World War II and is now uh, produced by microbial uh, fermentation and immobilized enzyme technology uh, to produce penicillin. Other antibiotics, which aren't naturally produced uh, by mold, uh, have been produced by site-directed mutagenesis, which is basically where they take a sample of bacteria make changes to it and see which changes weakens the bacteria and then they try to synthesize molecules um, which uh, make those changes. Uh, so let's look more in detail into these antibiotic molecules then, uh, which can either be bacteriostatic or bacteriocidal. Bacteriostatic meaning they prevent bacteria from replicating, meaning that uh, the infection just keeps stagnant, it doesn't grow or bactericidal, they kill the bacteria. Uh, and these, both these types of molecules, they'll interfere with a pathogen's metabolic activity uh, so that it cannot survive without harming the host cells. Uh, and that's called selective toxicity, where you basically try to reach something called the therapeutic index, uh, a serum concentration that is just enough to kill bacteria, but not quite enough to harm the human body cells. Unfortunately, though, sometimes we enter that toxic range, uh, and when, once you enter the toxic range, bad things happen. Like, uh, for example, our favorite, beta-lactams or penicillins, um, can cause diarrhea and abdominal pains uh, because they change the levels of microflora in the gut. Uh, so, for example, abdominal pains can be caused by uh, the overgrowth of C. difficile, uh, which releases enterotoxins, and that's what causes abdominal pains. Uh, you can also have jaundice or kidney damage or hepatitis caused by uh, certain antibiotics. And aminoglycosides affect the uh, renal system by damaging uh, the convoluted tubules in the nephron, uh, which is in the kidney. Uh, so those are all uh, disadvantages of antibiotics. Uh, now, I spoke to my... Uh, my godfather, uh, Ray Corrin from the World Health Organization, and he basically um, gave me one of th this quote here to help me to understand how antibiotics work. And I think it's really useful, so I'll just read it out to you. Think of active sites of the bacterial enzymes as being the keyhole, and the substrates of the enzyme-controlled reactions as being the key. If you want to open the door, create the products of the reaction, the key will have to fit into the keyhole. 
The role of antibiotics is to act as a plasticine that blocks up that, uh, that keyhole. So by the time the key comes along, it can't fit. Therefore, you cannot open the door. Uh, and this is basically saying, it's visualizing how antibiotics work, where it prevents, say, enzyme-controlled reactions happening in the pathogen uh, by blocking up their active site so that they cannot catalyze uh, those reactions. Uh, and I'll just end my section on antibiotics with a few examples of uh, antibiotics. So uh, our favorite penicillins uh, and also glycopeptides focus on the peptidoglycan cell wall. Uh, then rifampicin, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, and streptogramins focus on uh, protein synthesis, uh, so prevent, preventing uh, the synthesis of proteins. Rifampicin, for example, um, prevents transcription of proteins in the nucleus um, by inhibiting the production of RNA polymerase. Um, whereas the, the last three, uh, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, and streptogramins, uh, inhibit translation. Uh, finally, quinolones and metronidazole uh, inhibit DNA synthesis, which in their, therefore uh, turns into protein synthesis. Uh, by, so quinolones restrict the production of G DNA gyrase. Now DNA gyrase uh, is particularly selectively toxic. Uh, remember the word selective toxicity? It means it just harms the bacteria, not the humans. And the reason it does that is because G DNA gyrase, gyrase uh, supercoils the uh, circular DNA in bacteria into a nucleoid. Now, um, humans don't have circular DNA and they don't have DNA gyrase, so this doesn't affect them. Uh, so th that's why quinolones is especially uh, effective. And finally, metronidazole uh, produces toxic metabolites uh, which dam damages DNA. Uh, so those are all different examples of how our main mainstream antibiotics uh, are, are functioning. So, now that we've covered bacteria and antibiotics, let's look at what the future looks like. I've put a picture of Charles Darwin up here, um, just because his theory of natural selection uh, explains brilliantly what the future looks like, uh, and it is a little bit bleak, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so basically, the idea of natural selection in an antibiotic sense is that you've got a sample of bacteria, Antibiotics come along and create evolutionary pressure, uh, which changes the environment. It means that alleles that used to be um, non-advantageous, but alleles which uh, cause resistance uh, against antibiotics, those alleles will become favorable. Bacteria with those alleles will be more likely to uh, replicate, so the next generation will be more likely to contain these resistant genes or these resistant alleles. Um, now, I've, been, I've said the word resistant alleles quite a lot in the last 30 seconds. Uh, let me just show you what those resistant alleles actually code for uh, when it comes to uh, antibiotic resistance. So, a gene might code for the alteration of uh, an enzyme. So, if the enzyme's active site changes ever so slightly, remember that the, uh, uh, the metaphor of the key in the keyhole? Well, if the, the alteration of the target site means the keyhole changes slightly, so when the plasticine comes along, the antibiotic comes along, it can't block up the keyhole. Uh, another uh, inner membrane proteins can also be coded for by resistant genes uh, to create efflux mechanisms, where these inner membrane proteins pump out um, the antibiotics from the, the bacterial cell. You might have enzyme inactivation or enzyme addition where enzymes are coded for either which degrade the antibiotics um, directly or they, uh, they catalyze a reaction that creates functional groups which indirectly um, degrades the enzyme. Finally, you can have an impermeable cell wall co uh, coded for or a resistant gene can uh, code for another way of carrying out a metabolic process. If a bacteria prevents protein synthesis in one way, for example, this gene might code for 
another way to synthesize proteins, uh, which will therefore uh, prevent the antibiotic from actually working. Um, now, once these resistant genes have come about, they can spread between bacterial populations uh, in four different ways. Uh, and this is what we really got to be scared about, because it's the ways that they, they spread that, um, that is going uh, is going to make multi-resistant populations of bacteria. Uh, so, f for example, uh, transformation is where one bacteria comes and invades another and takes uh, its, its circular DNA, which incidentally happens to have a resistance gene in it. Then you'll have a conjugate, conjugation where if a resistance gene is placed on a plasmid, the plasmid is taken out of the, it, it's mobilized and comes into another bacterial population uh, and makes that bacterial population resistant as well. So transposomes work in a similar way, where they're, except they're just sections of circular DNA that can be mobilized. Uh, and bacteriophages, interestingly, uh, are not actually part of the bacteria at all. They are parasites of bacteria that come in, they're viruses, and they come in and they steal bits of DNA, um, which incidentally happens to have resistance genes in it. Then they, they infect another bacteria, and spread that resistance gene. So, everything that I've said so far sounds a little bit gloom and doom. Like, all our antibiotics are going to go down and we cannot do anything about it. We're heading for an apocalypse. However, we have to remember that there are potential developments uh, to antibiotics. Um, so, for example, you can have uh, the multi-antibiotic technique uses two different antibiotics to kill the pathogen, um, and that basically increases likelihood. Uh, there's uh, devil milk, uh, marsupial's milk uh, uh, includes catholicidins, which are killing resistant uh, bacteria, which is great. Uh, and finally, uh, I didn't include this in my EPQ, but this is really interesting. I heard it on the radio the other day. Um, and uh, there's a pathogenic, uh, a bacterial pathogen, but basically it is a bacteria itself, but it feeds off of other pathogens, um, which, is, uh, which is great for us because it means that it can kill pathogens that we don't like. Uh, brilliant. So, now that we've got the science out of the way, let's look at the question, how should we respond to the antibiotic resistance crisis? Um, so first of all, should we do anything at all? Well, there's argument from the other side like overpopulation and unnaturalness of using antibiotics, but overall science says yes, the basic right to life always overrides antibiotics are the correct way of doing things, um, and we need to develop our medicine uh, to fight the antibiotic resistance crisis and therefore uh, prevent a lot of suffering. Um, so let's identify the problems that are encouraging antibiotic resistance. You've got overuse of anti antibiotics in agriculture, uh, overuse on humans, so the prescription rates are soaring out of, uh, out of proportion, and uh, pharmaceutical companies are being irresponsible uh, with the way they're doing things. So basically, uh, for them, it's, uh, it's profitable. Pro the motivation of profit isn't coinciding with the motivation of humanity, where, um, for example, cancer treatments are much more um, are much more profitable because cancer patients take treatment for their whole life, whereas um, and bacterial uh, in infected people only take it for a short course of time, uh, so. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are being a bit irresponsible. Uh, and finally, patients are misusing them, they take their course, uh, they finish their course too early. Uh, so, my conclusions are that we need to improve husbandry systems on farms uh, in order to do this, uh, because farms have too much disease, so if we Im improve their systems on farms, then we will reduce disease. Uh, we need to transfer power uh, over drug development from private pharmaceutical companies who are irresponsible 
I suggested maybe to nationalised government owned organisations, but um, I'm not sure, just as long as it's not all in the power of these profit motivated uh, organisations uh, who might not prevent resistance. Finally, we need to, uh, well, I'll talk about controlling antibiotic consumption, which basically